Well, my name is Sean Bentley. I've been with uh, Desai Solutions for about 11 years now. I've been uh, doing a lot of technical support and training and a variety of other miscellaneous things, but pretty much, pretty much my roles uh, sort of fit under one umbrella. It's to educate our customers on SOLIDWORKS and particularly simulation is one area that I specialize in uh, pretty heavily. So today we'll be, I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the new features in SOLIDWORKS Simulation 2018. We'll focus mostly on uh, our structural analysis side and our flow uh, flow simulation as well. For anybody who's interested in plastics, feel free to let me know. I can kind of uh, talk about some of the new functionality in that tool as well, and maybe if there's enough demand, uh, I can uh, also show another, maybe do another webinar in the future on on that topic. Now, uh, I'd like to get into our topics for today, though. Just before I do, I'm going to launch a quick poll. Just wondering which of the topics uh, brought you here today, if it was just the structural or the topology, if those were the words that uh, kind of uh, made you register, or if it was the flow and thermal side, or maybe it's both. All right, so uh, quite a number of people here for, for both topics, really, kind of broad scope. Uh, but it looks like it's le the, it leans more, as, as I expected, more towards the uh, structural side. Um, so, all right gives me a rough sense of uh, uh, of the general interest today. Thank you. All right, so well, um, on the agenda for today, some of the main topics that I picked, uh, the, what's, the What's New document is literally hundreds of pages long, or uh, a little over 100, rather, and uh, the simulation portion of it's uh, only a few pages, but still uh, to try to pick out uh, my favorite things. Um, this is uh, what I arrived at, on, at least on the structural and flow side. So on the structural uh, side of things, I'd like to talk about a stress singularity diagnostic tool that they've added. Uh, another tool for importing and converting results from a text file, which we'll talk more about. And then uh, I'll maybe save the best for last, the topology study. And then on the flow side, we'll look at a tool called sector periodicity. Then uh, uh, look at some post-processing um, utilities, uh, the FFT plot, uh, multi-ISOs and gradients. Some of these aren't even listed in the in the what's new. Um, I actually had to do some research in the background to uh, figure these ones out. And then, uh, but they're they're pretty cool. And then the uh, final thing we'll look at there is the free surface modeling. So I'm going to start on the structural side, and uh, starting with the stress singularity diagnostic tool. So this is a, a brand new tool, 2018. They, they've enhanced uh, another tool from that they added in 17 called the uh, Stress Hotspot tool. They've added another functionality to it that allows it to, to, to find uh, stress singularities, basically points where there's infinite stress. So it's a bit of an education tool. It's one that's helpful in our training classes to show singularities. Um, and, but if you're already familiar with singularities, uh, then this tool might have a bit of limited utility for you, but what I'd like to do is show it anyway and how, uh, how you can use it to find uh, some of the singularities in this uh, simple model here. So this uh, new stress singularity uh, finder, so to speak, um, will allow me to detect uh, regions where my stresses may not be accurately reported. Uh, that's what we call a stress singularity, um, where the stresses might be infinite. So with this tool, I can rule out some of those regions. If I launch the 2017 stress hotspot diagnostic tool, this is, the, this is an old tool, well, relatively old. It tells me that there are stress hotspots, but then what they've added to 2018 is this additional step that allows me to hone in on some of those hotspots. Here I see it found uh, a couple of edges where my uh, stresses are high. Okay, so you can kind of see the way I have this model loaded. It just has a simple force on it that's going to bend this tab. And the way I've fixed it was just fixing these holes here and here and fixing these edges. So you can see it's reporting uh, some problems with uh, fixed edges that I've applied here. It's highlighting this edge for me, saying that there's an issue with that. It's highlighting this edge, saying that there's a singularity issue there. Okay, this edge here as well, and also uh, maybe a bit surprising. It's highlighting this edge around the uh, 
uh, where I'm applying the load, which maybe makes sense now I look at it, it's a sharp edge. So I can see if my stresses are convergent in these areas. If I tell it to refine the mesh, do a typical convergence check, you can see if I type in 0.5 for the element size, it's just cutting the element size in half, and it's going to run a bunch of iterations with each basically having the mesh size on, on both of these, uh, on all four of these regions. And it'll give me a nice chart and, tell, and show me what the stresses look like uh, in each of those, those four areas. What I'm hoping to see after it's done running this, if they aren't singularities anyway, you'd see a, a pattern that looks like this where the stresses converge. Okay. But uh, odds are, based on the fact that I reported these as singularities, I might see a pattern that looks more like this, which tells me it's a singularity issue. So um, it gives me, uh, as soon as it's done running, it gives me that same kind of uh, help graphic. But then, after I click OK to that, I can see the, uh, the results here. If I plot the convergence graphs, it shows me that, look, look at all these stresses. They all seem to be rising. Every time it does a refinement, each additional level of refinement, the stresses increase. They don't converge. Except for, I wonder about this last one here. It's a little hard to tell on which, which edge is that. That's edge number one. So on this one here, maybe the, maybe the stresses do converge. So let me look at that one more carefully. No, when I zoom in on that one, it looks like those are divergent as well. So this is another singularity issue. So I can't, I can't rely on the stress results in uh, any of these four regions because they're all divergent. That's basically what this tool is telling me. If you need to learn more about these stress hotspots, it even gives you a little help file that kind of walks you through. It's very similar to lesson two of our SOWRC simulation training class. So, uh, so that shows the, the stress singularity diagnostic, kind of a neat little utility. But um, again, if you're already familiar with this concept of stress singularities, you might might be able to work around uh, using it. It's kind of for uh, been put in for maybe newer users who want to learn more about this subject. The next tool I'd like to show you though is uh, this import uh, or convert results from a text file. Now this 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 is going to be a bit advanced. That last the last topic I was talking about was a little bit advanced as well, but this one especially. Um, when I first uh, read about this enhancement, I was a little bit like, uh, well, who might care about that? I'm not sure what, what the utility of that is. But then when I, when I thought about it a bit more, I saw some of the, the power of this, uh, what you can do with this enhancement. So basically the idea is we can take a text file, we can take a, or like an Excel file that has node numbers, one, two, three, four, five, all your node numbers, and then we can import the results onto all of those node numbers. So this gives you raw power over uh, what's being uh, shown in the result graphic. So it gives you a lot of ability to be able to, you can export your results from SOLIDWORKS simulation, you can do some Excel magic on it, and then you can re-import it. And it gives you a lot of ability to be able to customize your results to sort of fine tune the things that you're, you're trying to show and trying to illustrate. So do things like uh, set up equations to do like a logarithmic or an exponential type of a function on to really highlight certain certain aspects of your results. Now, maybe one potential utility uh, of having this additional raw power, I'll I'll demonstrate. And I'll just use the same same model here. And uh, sometimes when you look at uh, stresses, okay, on uh, when I'm pushing on this, I have compressive stresses here and tensile stresses there. And depending on which mat what material I make this out of. Uh, certain materials have uh, higher uh, compressive strength than they have tensile strength. So it's really this region here, depending on which material I select, this region here is going to be under uh, more intense stresses or to be more likely to fail here. So that's, that sort of thing is what our more Coulomb factor safety plot will indicate. It shows me red here, whereas over on this side, it's, uh, it's kind of a lighter color, kind of a blue, and maybe some mesh refinement could help there. But... Uh, the, the conditions behind more Coulomb are uh, somewhat complex. If I show the formula, it's sort of like a bunch of if-then statements, which uh, it's, uh, you need a, you'd need Microsoft Excel or something to sort of program this, this sort of thing in. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to show a plot that, that shows me just the intensity of the stresses, where this plot is a little hard to see the, 
like I was expecting to see this region in like sharp red, whereas this region over here in blue, and you, you can kind of customize your chart to do that kind of thing, but uh, I want something that pops out more like a stress plot. So what I'll, what I'll need to do is I'll need to export these results. So I'll grab my, uh, my entire solid body. Let's grab it from my body filter here, or maybe do a quick rebuild. Hmm, must have some other filter enabled, do I? Let's see. Hmm, I can select face here, just a moment. Oh, it might be because I still have these convergence graphs active from the last one. All right, so let's try that again. All right, interesting. So uh, anyway, uh, my, my goal here, once again, uh, to get us back on track, I was gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna export the, the, all the results that I see here, and I'm gonna sort of use uh, Excel to convert them into results that might be more uh, engaging. So in order to do that, I'm just using the, the standard functionality, the SOWWORKS list selected tool. Okay, so this is nothing new that I'm showing you at the moment. But then now if I open up that, uh, that spreadsheet, I'm going to convert it into just kind of a node numbers in one column and, uh, and uh, f basically the factor safety is in the other. So here's what that spreadsheet looks like by default. And I'm just going to format it so it matches more what our imported tool is looking for. I don't need these XYZ coordinates of all the nodes. So I really just need the node numbers and the factors of safety that it reports. And now I'll use Excel to do, like maybe if I'm, if I'm looking for like a percentage of how close it is to failing, if I see this like factor safety of 1.4, that indicates it's, it's, it's like 60% of the way there to failing or 70%, somewhere in that ballpark. So in other words, I'm gonna take the inverse and multiply by 100 to these values. And so that a factor safety of 1.4 really means it's like 72% to failure. Okay, so it's, now what I'll do is I'll copy the, this uh, column and like replace the original. And now I don't need this uh, column anymore or this row. Okay, so this is exactly the format that uh, SOLIDWORKS is going to look for when you re-import your results. So I'll go ahead and, again, this is a very raw tool. It gives you raw power over the uh, results. Uh, so it is a, it's not very user-friendly at the moment. As, as you can see, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, conversion work, but it gives you, a, again, pretty raw power over the result reporting. So now uh, I can import those results just by plotting imported results here. I'll browse to that same uh, file that I created. Should be this uh, first one here, I believe. And I'll import the node numbers. So now here it sort of, it flips the whole chart over and really, really shows you a little more clearly where those hot spots are. Here is like where my, uh, how, how close am I to failing? If I probe some of these regions, what percentage here it's telling me about 91%. If I let me use uh, instead of scientific notation, make it a little easier to read as well. But anyway, it shows me uh, in this region, looks like about 91% of the way there to failure in the ballpark, 82% here and so on. Okay, so rather than looking at uh, Factors of safety, sometimes it's a little more handy to look at how close are you to failing from this perspective. It's a little easier to see these red hot spots and, uh, and down here, but there's a singularity issue there, so we know to factor that one out. Okay. So again, uh, what I showed you there was uh, a tool that gives you the, a raw ability over the results uh, just by being able to key in uh, node numbers in one column and the results you're looking for in the other column, you're able to import those. Um, so you could also use this to uh, import results potentially from other softwares, but you do have to match node numbers up. You'd have to be using the same mesh between both uh, softwares. All right, so next what I'd like to cover is uh, the topology study. So let's take a look at, uh, at this new feature. This is uh, one of the big ones. This is, this is probably my favorite enhancement on the uh, structural side. So the idea behind uh, topology studies is um, we're using the uh, Tosca engine from uh, Abacus 
in order to take uh, a design space and remove material for it from it uh, somewhat automatically. All you need to do is tell it where your fixtures are going to be located, tell it where your loads are going to be located, and give it this this large this enlarged design space, and it'll it'll run through these iterations to try to remove material to try to come up with an automatic optimiz optimized shape. Now, frequently the shapes you'll get uh, might look more organic, almost like uh, bone structures. It's almost like it's going through an evolutionary process to get to the final optimized shape. Um, so uh, a lot of times it'll be a little it'd be difficult or impossible to machine some of the shapes that it produces. So you could use you could use this a couple ways. You could use it as um, as a design guideline. So I could use this uh, optimized shape to come up with a uh, a frame structure that might look very similar to this. Um, or if you're uh, creating things like castings, uh, there are some manufacturing uh, constraints that you can set up in the software to make sure that it'll be manufacturable for certain types of uh, structures. So let me show you uh, an example of the, optim of the topology optimization. So in this case, very simple model to, to illustrate how you, could, you can go about setting one of these up. So by the way, this uh, topology study, it's avail you, many of you may already have it. It's part of Simulation Professional and Simulation Premium. So if you have licenses to either of those tools, you'll be able to go right in and set up these types of studies in SOLIDWORKS 2018. So you'll have to be on subscription or at least have um, SOLIDWORKS 20, access to SOLIDWORKS 2018 to be able to use these these topology studies. But the idea here is, um, you see I've constructed this simple design space and I've, I just colored some of the faces to indicate where I'm going to be putting a fixture, where I'm going to be putting a load. So I need to transfer load from here to here. So I've built sort of the, maybe what I think is the maximum design space that uh, where I could see the optimized structure uh, likely appear. So I'm going to create a new study. And I'll select my new topology study. And you see in 2018, we've sort of reorganized uh, this whole interface over here, kind of put it in categories or groups. But you'll find that the topology study under this design insight section. And in a new, in a new topology study, it, uh, it looks just like a static study, except it has a few uh, additional uh, things that you'll need to set up, goals and constraints and manufacturing controls. But other than that, you'll pretty much set it up just like a static study. I'll apply material. I'll apply my fixture. I'll apply a load. And, I'll, and this for this first study, I'm going to make the load uh, just a bending load, vertical bending load. And then now the, uh, the new things that you'll need to do is set up goals and constraints. There are a couple different goals that you can set up that for to optimize for. For example, you could try to your goal could be to minimize the displacement. Now, of course, the minimum displacement would be as if I just included this entire structure. So you'll set up uh, if you use this kind of goal, you'll have to set up how much mass do you want to remove. You can tell it 50% mass, and it'll try to find the best 50% mass that's needed to minimize the displacement. You can minimize the mass with while trying to maintain a certain amount of displacement. You want to keep the displacement under a millimeter and you want to minimize the mass. It'll come up with that. Or you can try to calculate the best stiffness to weight ratio. Now this is the default and it's recommended that you start with this for, um, for many of your initial optimization studies. Now all three of these uh, have the, sort of the same tone to them in, in that you're, you're always balancing mass and displacement. Okay, that's, we're not looking at stresses in any of our studies yet. That's not currently supported in, in this release. So for this first study, I, I, I was using this uh, best stiffness to weight ratio to get the shape I was showing you in the slide earlier. And then here I tell it how much I want to reduce the mass by. I'll say, uh, since I've drawn such a large structure here, I'll say reduce the mass all by up to 97 or like 95, 97%. So some very large amount. And that, that would give me a small, small frame comparison. You can add additional constraints as well to tell it to make sure the displacement stays below some value. Now, once I've set up my uh, goal, 
then I'll create a uh, some manufacturing constraints as well. For example, if you want to make sure it gives you a symmetry, a symmetric uh, design, um, you can add symmetry planes. Or if you if you do plan on making like a mold or casting, uh, you can use the specified demold direction to tell it it's going to be a mid plane pull direction in one direction or um, or do a stamping. So it'll, it'll try to make sure it optimizes in such a way that it gives you something that's manufacturable simply by selecting the, the direction of pull. So uh, different manufacturing constraints, but that's pretty much it for the setup. From this point, you could mesh it, and I'll use a very coarse mesh. And now the, it does take a while to run these studies. So I'll just show you sort of the final result from a few different, by changing a few different settings. And you can you can see the types of optimized shapes that it gives you. So under this under this loading scenario, with a fairly coarse mesh, um, it gives me it gives me the optimized result that you see here, like I was showing in the slide a moment ago. If I were to ran that that study I showed you. Now, if I try to optimize for a side load case, um, it gives me a very different looking structure. If I try to apply a side load to this instead, you can see gives me this type of a shape, trying to support that side load. Now, because these are two co potential combinations that I'm worried about, that vertical load and that side load, but you can see there's sort of a problem here. If I, if I optimize around one, if I just optimize around the vertical load, um, it gives me a structure that's really built well for vertical loads. And if I optimize around just the side load, it gives me a structure that's built really well for just side loads. But if I have some sort of combination of those two, then uh, what should that look like? You can actually combine different load cases, okay? And you can use a tool that's uh, it's been in the software for a little while. It's called uh, the Load Case Manager, where you can set up multiple load cases. And in here, I've created two load cases. Load case one has me apply a thousand newton vertical load. Load case two has apply a, basically a quarter of that as a side load, two hundred fifty newtons as in this at the side. And so it'll optimize around both of these cases simultaneously and it should give me a uh, more complex looking structure. If I look at the uh, result of this, you can see it's, it's kind of a com almost a combination of the vertical load and the side load case where you see this extra, these extra uh, supports in the middle here. Now, uh, under some situations, you, you might get some weird looking results. Um, maybe I'll show you some, uh, like for example here, you can kind of see what's it suggesting here. Some material floating off in space, or also this, this bar here seems kind of strange, where it's just going off and then connecting to virtually nothing. But really, uh, when you're looking at these optimized results, to look at a fuller picture of the results, you might need to edit the result plot and drag this slider left and right a little bit. And you can see actually what's going on there is it needs it needs. It thinks it needs some support here could help, suggesting that some support here could help. And you can see the, uh, it's saying it might be okay to remove this region, but you might you might consider adding it to your final design. Okay, it's saying that it's probably not gonna help as much as some of these other supports that it has in, uh, down here. Now the mesh does make a big difference to your optimized result as well. Um, here shows different size meshes. Okay, if I use a very coarse mesh, here's the kind of optimized result I get. Very simplistic. You can kind of see the big elements. Okay, you can't, since it has a very coarse mesh, very restricted as far as how tight, how small it can make the diameters of the tubes. So it has to go with these big tubes to support that simple vertical load. And as I make the mesh finer, though, it gives it more flexibility to be able to make these tubes smaller and smaller. And you actually see it transition, starts transitioning to this kind of a structure as I make the mesh finer. Finer still, and eventually it starts looking like a, almost like a spider webish kind of, or like a like a roll cage. So you get some very just by tightening the mesh up and just hitting run again, and then the the final run here, this one uh, took about four. This last one took about four hours to run, and it had in the ballpark of uh, three hundred thousand degrees of freedom. Okay, and I can imagine this if you if you keep extrapolating this though, if you really refine and refine and refine the mesh even further. You'd almost have a spider web looking design. It would almost be able to create very thin tubes. So there's a certain level of refinement that I think is useful. And then beyond that, it's it starts to get um, a bit too abstract with uh, the webbing that it does. 
But something along these lines here or here, I think could be useful uh, design guidance for how you might uh, build a, a stiff uh, cage structure in this case to support this load. All right, so I think uh, that was all the key things I wanted to show you there. There's a bunch, a uh, bunch more little things we can we can go over with that. But uh, if there's any questions regarding that, feel free to post them in the chat, and then we'll move on to uh, our flow studies next. But uh, I guess to recap, what I showed there with that topology study was uh, we can use these studies to um, really narrow down your design just to critical regions uh, that that you really need just to support a, a, a load cases, a bunch of different load cases. So next we'll move into uh, our flow simulation, our fluid dynamics. So three, uh, three big enhancements here that I wanted to talk about. Um, sector periodicity, then we'll look at some of the different post-processing tools. Uh, a few of them are, are, are pretty advanced, but uh, give certain uh, niche applications a little bit more uh, capability. And then uh, finally, uh, the free surface modeling. So on the flow simulation side, starting with uh, sector periodicity, this gives you additional symmetry capability where um, previously we could we could cut things into like a quarter symmetry or half symmetry or an eighth symmetry. It had to be like uh, symmetric planes, kind of like how the SOWWORKS mirror tool works. You're, mirror, you're able to mirror over planes. Um, so now uh, in, in SOWWORKS flow simulation uh, 2018, uh, we can do uh, sort of like a circular pattern of symmetry or what we call sector periodicity. So in this case, uh, I'll show you uh, using the sector periodicity on a simple three-bladed uh, fan. Now uh, imagine, though, if you had um, uh, parts that have like 100 blades on them, potentially. This, that's where sector periodicity really starts to help. Okay, really uh, reduces the solve time. So let's take a look at that uh, sector periodicity. Now the uh, sector periodicity works uh, well if, like, I'm not including the um, the support structure behind the fan because that wouldn't get patterned around, right? So my goal here is to try to determine how much torque acts on the fan blades. Uh, my goal is to try to design a good blades that'll give me a good torque curve. Um, so I'm going to eliminate a lot of the other details that don't don't really follow the periodicity, the the uh, patterned periodicity. Now, in order to set up uh, sector periodicity, you just have to edit the computational domain. You can already see it just when I click on it. You can already see what I've set up here. But if I edit this, you just turn on this axial periodicity, select an axis. In this case, you can select a cylindrical face if you have one, or just create an axis and pick on it. And then tell it how many, like how many times you're patterning around. In this case, just three. I only have three blades here. And the periodicity doesn't actually have to go in a nice, neat way through one of the blades like this. I could have actually, like, I could run it where I rotate it like one rad. You know, it could kind of go halfway through two blades, and it should give me a very similar result that way as well. So it doesn't have to neatly cut through uh, a blade like this, but it just it makes the animations look a little cleaner. Um, but that's pretty much it. Once you set up that periodicity, it really reduces the, uh, the domain size, so it really speeds up the analysis. Now if I show you the, the mesh, now it only needs to mesh like this third of the model. Okay. So uh, uh, that, that way it'll run a lot faster. Now again, imagine if you only had to sector down to like a, uh, if you had 20 blades or something, you'd only be running almost 1 20th of the model. It'd be a lot faster. Okay, so mostly this is used for speed. Now, uh, when I look at the results, so I already uh, ran the study. This one, I'll show you the run times of the different uh, different ways you can run it and the kind of results you get. But uh, when I look at the results here, I'll load up the Transient Explorer. and Let's look at these couple of plots. And I'll play that. Rotate a bit so you can see it a bit better. Now I'm not sure how well the anime it might be a bit choppy through the uh, through the webinar tool. Maybe if I zoom out, it might look a little smoother that way because it's not updating as many pixels. Okay, 
but I'm not sure how well it's really, if it's choppy or not. It looks smooth on my end, but it depends on how good my internet connection is. You see, really, it's only animating the one blade spinning around. It's not actually showing all three blades. Okay. So uh, the, maybe in a future release, they'll, they'll allow you to sort of uh, mirror like the full, make it look like the full structure after you run it with sector periodicity, because they've done that with the symmetry tools as well already. Now, uh, if I'm trying to estimate the torque acting on the on the blades, you do have to multiply by the number of blades. So in this case, I have to multiply my torques by three to get make sure I get the right number. Um, so I've already done that. And to summarize in a slide here, here's sort of the difference between you, you could run this basically three different ways. There's the old way, the average is a flow simulation averaging approach, which uh, used to have to do this averaging approach back in 2012 and prior. Um, I, it would give me a torque of 0.46, and it would take 422 seconds to run. A more accurate way to do it, and probably the most accurate in, this, in these three cases, would be to use the sliding approach with the full model. Um, I got a torque of 0.453 on the blades, and uh, uh, it took 586 seconds. But then using the periodicity, it cuts that time down, but it does compromise the accuracy of the results a little bit because it, it sort of it forces the results to be symmetric. If there's some turbulence that would cause the results to kind of oscillate to be asymmetric, uh, the periodicity is going to force it to stay symmetric, so it requires a little bit more energy to force it to stay symmetric. So you can see it overestimates a little bit of the uh, the periodicity results. Just a moment. All right, apologize. Just had a quick interruption there. Now, um, so again, to summarize uh, what's shown on this slide is um, the uh, periodicity helps speed it up substantially, um, but it does force symmetry. And so in situations where the turbulence might cause some asymmetry, it may require more energy and therefore a little bit more force in this case. So it does compromise, it can compromise the accuracy a little bit. But now how much it compromises the accuracy depends on how much extra energy it takes to force that symmetry in the results. Now, I notice a question on uh, the roll cage, the Tosca thing here. Let me just take a moment. I haven't used I haven't used the SolidWorks. I haven't used the simulation tools in SolidWorks, but used it in Ansys. I was wondering if there is some sort of smooth feature to generate most rigid roll cage that can be refined easier than estimating by using results as a design guide. Um, there, you we can uh, export. The, a smoothed shape as a solid body or a graphics body, and that might make it easier to, uh, to draw lines. And you'll, you'll still have to use it as a bit of a design guide, though. Um, but there is an option to export those, the results that are shown um, from our uh, uh, topology tool. Okay. So um, maybe I could show that uh, a little bit later on. I can try the export and so you can see for yourself what it looks like. So. But hopefully, I gives you a start on the answer to that question. All right, so um, back on track here. The to be just talked about sector periodicity. Now we'll move on to uh, some of the different post-processing enhancements that they've added to Flow 2018. Um, an FFT plot, multiple multiple ISOs, and gradients. Now a few of these are a little bit advanced, so uh, I'll do a, a a bit of a deep dive into a few of them, and um, but we'll see what. Uh, but not too deep, hopefully. Uh, we'll see what we're talking about here. So the first one I'll look at is these the new FFT plot. Um, so this is something that was requested. Uh, some people would ask, you know, can flow simulation estimate noise levels? Um, and now, to, uh, to a certain extent, now it can, using these new FFT plots. Now the idea is that we're going to take your time-dependent pressure data, so your pressures when you're, if you have a lot of turbulence in your model, and uh, your, your pressures are kind of bouncing up and down. We're going to take that time-dependent pressure data, and we're going to do a trans transform, a fast Fourier transform to convert it into a frequency domain where we can see these peaks represent certain different frequencies that all might couple together, creating sound. So the idea is that using the new FFT plot, we're going to take uh, pressure data as point goals. They must be set up as point goals of static pressure. We can create these little points in, in your model and then uh, look for 
what is the, uh, how did the pressure vary in those points? And see what the noise characteristics would be if you were to put like a little microphone at the at each of these little points. Uh, what would the what would the microphone be measuring as far as frequency and decibels that that kind of thing? So let me show you what this uh, this new feature looks like. So here, um, set up a very s simple uh, model so that it, it can it'll animate fairly quickly and kind of show you the rough ideas here. So let's animate one of these plots. Let's look at the near points one. So you can see this 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 animation shows how the uh, how the pressure oscillates. I have flow. This is um. This, there, there's air flowing over top of this, so it's like, uh, and this is about the width of your hand. This uh, cylinder is about the width of your hand, so it's kind of like if you were to, if you were to stick your hand out the car window, if you're traveling at uh, roughly s expressway speeds, say uh, somewhere in the ballpark of uh, 70 miles per hour, 80 miles per hour down the expressway. Uh, this is sort of the pressure wake that would go behind your hand. Okay, so you can see the. Uh, the, the oscillations up and down of that, those those pressures. Um, so if I were to pick a, a couple points here, if I look at this point here, for example, you can see the different pressure levels that this point is experiencing. And that that's if I were to put a little tiny microphone there, that would be interpreted as sound. Now the further away I get, let me, let me show some of the far field oscillations and maybe uh, bump that level up here a little bit. Kind of hone in on the yellow region. It looks like so. A lot of see so you can adjust these graphs just by dragging these around a little bit. And I'll go much closer into the light blue area. So far away as well. There's all. It's also experiencing some oscillations. Okay. So you see the pressure. These pressure deltas are touching this point further away. So this is this might be like where you're sitting, where your ear is located. Okay. So much smaller oscillations experienced out here than. Than right behind uh, your hand, so to speak, or or think of this maybe also as it could be the side view mirror. So what I want to do is see how much noise is being uh, generated. What, what's the noise being experienced here? What's the noise experienced there? And that's that's the objective of these new FFT plots. So if I edit one of these FFT now, in order to create an FFT, FFT plot, it's just under your your flow simulation results. This is where the new tool is located. Okay, So in order to be able to create one of these, you have to run it as a time. Yeah, it has to be a transient study, a time-dependent study, and you have to create point goals uh, of pressure. Okay, Once you've done those things, you can create a new, you can create these FFT plots, and then we can look at, let's look at pressure five. That's the, that's like our ear way up here. So here's, here's the pressure fluctuations that our ear is experiencing from just our hand sticking out the window. Now there's a lot of other fluctuations going on with that scenario too, but just solely from our hand. And uh, if after it does the FFT of that, the fast Fourier transform, uh, here's what the results look like. It, say, it says that there's a frequency around 200 hertz. This oscillation is occurring at around, if I hover my cursor, 203.9 hertz it says, with a magnitude of 1.7. Really that converts to a decibel level of about 50 decibels. Okay, 50 decibels. It sounds like a lot, but really, uh, if you put it on the scale, uh, 70 decibels is around vacuum cleaner. 50 decibels is about a quarter of that sound. So it's kind of like a, a conversational uh, sound, or, or like the um, so very pretty light. Yeah, just from sticking your hand out the window, it's the sound is is fairly light. Now. If I look a lot, if I look, if I were to put a little microphone just behind where the pressure levels are oscillating much larger, like right in this region, the pressure the pressure oscillations are much larger. Um, there, I'd see uh, more like 70 decibels. So right behind there, the microphone would sort of be experiencing this, the same sound level you'd experience from vacuuming. Okay, so at that 70 level, at about 150 or so decibels, I think that's where 
uh, eardrum rupture occurs. So we're well, we're pretty far away from that. So. All right, so moving back here. So that was the uh, the new FFT plot, allows you to estimate noise levels. Then uh, another enhancement, well, we can do multi-ISOs rather than one at a time and gradients. These two kind of go hand in hand a little bit um, in the sense that we're going to be looking at uh, uh, pressure deltas. Okay, something's very common in, in uh, flow simulation studies is to look at pressure gradients or pressure deltas and now we have a we've added a gradients to the list of uh, results that we can look at so what is a gradient a gradient is just a, uh, essentially a change like a three-dimensional delta a change in in three dimensions or or n dimensions as many dimensions as you like now in this case uh, this two-dimensional we can see large gradients from here to here where it goes blue all the way to red so you see these arrows depict the size of the gradients Okay. Now, uh, in flow simulation, we'll be able to really highlight the size of these arrows, these magnitudes with, with colors. So if, I wanna, if, if this blue to red represents a pressure gradient, the arrows would represent flow because it would be really pushing flow pretty heavily. So gradients are very important for uh, flow studies. So let me look at uh, an example of how you might use these gradients. So I'll go ahead and see here. It's a very simple uh, model, pretty easy to wrap your head around pretty quick here, just a simple pipe. However, uh, I've got I've got a rel relatively large elbow here and a very tight uh, elbow down here. Yeah, as a matter of fact, so tight, let me, let me look at, let's do a comparison here, this radius you see here, nice smooth radius down here, I made it so tight that it's a sharp corner, so we're going to see which one leads to large pressure drops or where we're going to have pressure large pressure gradients okay so looking at the results I just have flow it's it's coming in from here and it's flowing around these corners and from the from the inlet to the outlet there's a pressure there's going to be a total pressure drop of uh, uh, around 10 psi okay It's a simple model. Take a moment to load the result. I used a pretty fine mesh so I could really show uh, the gradients pretty clearly. So it does take a moment there. All right. So let's look at the pressure deltas. Now, the conventional way, the the way that you you do it in 2017, 2016, 20 in, in older versions, of course, would just be looking at maybe pressure cut plots. And this is a pretty handy way to look at it. For example, up here, if I just use the probe tool, I can see pressures up here in the ballpark uh, 23.4. Somewhere in this vicinity, they're about 21, and somewhere down here, they drop way off to about 15. So you can you can estimate the amount of pressure lost just going around this this tight elbow, just by looking at these numbers. 23.4. We lost about two of that going through one of the elbows, and then we lost about six of that going through the next elbow. Um, other conventional ways is to look at it from an XY plot perspective. I've generated a bunch of curves that sort of follow uh, the flow path. So you can see uh, those pressure drops. So here, as the flow is going along, it's losing pressure just being in the pipe. Okay, that's pipe pressure. That's just from the pipe diameter being kind of tight. And then a complex thing happens in the elbow, and then the pressure is a little bit lower. And then a complex thing happens in the next elbow, and then the pressure is even lower. So a big drop off. So there's something com complicated going on here. I wonder why it's losing pressure there. So these the, the two the two uh, tools I just showed you don't really give you a good sense of why it's losing pressure in those. I mean, we already have a, some idea, I think, but um, in more complex structures, sometimes to, to be able to probe why is it losing pressure in certain regions is uh, pretty, uh, very helpful. So with the new tool, in order to use this new tool, you have to uh, go into your engineering database in order to use the gradients tool. And we can create uh, custom visualization parameters. This is nothing new. Okay, we could, we could do this in previous versions, but really what's new here is the type of formulas you can enter include these grad terms. These, these are the gradients, the ones that'll, that will look at changes in the X direction, changes in the Y, and changes in the Z. So a bunch, uh, one way I'll do this maybe is I'll, I'll create a new one. 
and let's enter in a very simple formula. Let's call it pressure deltas or pressure gradient. And then uh, in the formula, I'll just say, let's just look at the gradient magnitude. Then we have to type, a, this isn't really self-evident, you have to type an open parenthesis, just like our other functions here. And then, then you can select the parameter you want to look at the gradient of, in this case, pressure. That's uh, static pressure, by the way. And I'll close the parenthesis. And that's at the simplest what, uh, an equation you might enter. And uh, there we go. So I'll save that. Now, in addition to that, once I've saved that parameter, now if I go and insert a, a new cut plot, now I'll have access to that, that equation that I just entered. That's uh, just an equation of my different results. I just have to add a parameter here and go under my custom and add the uh, pressure, which I already had one in here, but I'll add pressure gradient to the list. Not sure what it'll do if I have two of them, okay? Because I think I deleted the other one. But if I go ahead and select pressure gradient and click OK, this shows me this highlights in red uh, where 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 so where some of my pressure losses are occurring. And of course, you see in the elbows this this elbow I lose a little bit of pressure. You see very light colors. But this elbow down here, I'm losing a lot of pressure and. Go figure. Look at look at where where I'm losing. It's because of this sharp corner. It looks like that's where all these losses seem to be stemming from. So of course the elbow is a little too tight to begin with, but looks like that that's really one of the key features I need to change in order to uh, not lose so much pressure in my uh, flow. Now another way you can look at these gradients as well, uh, more three dimensionally. This is this sort of sort of shows me a two dimensional. The cut plot show me a two dimensional plot. But if I want to look more three-dimensionally at these gradients, I can use the new, there's a new tool inside the ISO surfaces. In previous versions, if you wanted to create multiple ISOs, you'd have to turn on these values and then create a sort of a staircase of different ISO values that you want to see. And that's sort of the old way of doing it. And this will show me more three-dimensionally where my large gradients are. So it's handy, but new, uh, new in 2018 is the ability to just, instead of having to manually adjust these values, you can just do number of levels and then tell it, I, I don't know, I just want like 20. Just give me 20 ISOs from min to max, just from the minimum to the maximum of my entire domain. So now if I just, uh, or I think I can, yeah, I'll try it at 20. If I just hit OK to that. So without having to do a lot of manual work, it gives me 20 ISOs very quickly. As, as a matter of fact, I'm tempted to bump it up even. Let's do like 100 of them. So before you were only limited to do, uh, I think it was only like a level, 11 ISOs. Okay, question on the units of the gradient. Uh, very good question. Uh, is it Tomas, very good question. The... Um, uh, the units in the gradient, it always uses SI units. And if you want to convert to some other units, then you'll have, you do have to enter in like manually some conversion factors. Um, so in this case, it's actually using a unit. Uh, it doesn't display it, but it's using a unit called, uh, it's just Pascals, which is SI, per meter. All right, so it's Pascals per meter. Now, for some of my gradients, I, I, I put in some units that make more sense. And I'll, maybe I'll show that real quick too, but... Uh, so coming back to that in a moment. So here I just generate 100 ISOs, and we can really see more three-dimensionally where those gradients are located. And it looks like they're all concentrated around that sharp corner there. Up here, not too much going on. They're all blue, so they're all fairly low. Okay, I've just asked for so many ISOs that show me quite a bit of stuff there. But uh, one little uh, extra thing, uh, maybe stemming a little bit off of Tomas's uh, question. So here I've, I've created a few other gradients, ones that might make more sense. Here's a, uh, but it does take a little bit more thought and sophistication with uh, with entering in the functions. But I think the one that makes most sense to me is using looking at total pressure, which is like the total energy of the fluid. Looking at that total pressure gradient, so it's like energy losses, but looking at those in the direction of the velocities. Okay, and I convert it to units of psi per inch. So how much how much pressure, how much psi I'm losing per inch of pipe, let's say. Now, the formula for that, though, I mean, I can, if you guys are really interested in this, I can copy, paste it, send it to you. Um, so just let me know. But here, I, in order to get in PSI per inch, which you, know, more, you do have to enter in these sort of conversion factors. Okay, not a big deal, but it's um, just take a little more, a little, time, a little more time and effort. And then the, the way this gradient looks, looks a little more, um, I like it a lot better than just looking at just standard pressure gradient. 
total pressure gradient in the velocity direction in PSI per inch. I know it's a lot. That's why I put this, this in the advanced section, I guess. Um, but now here, by just, by just using this equation, um, all right, yep, no, no problem. I'll send it to you. Is it Dana? Dana? Um, but we see here the pressure gradient. I see uh, larger losses in pressure here. It's always, it's, it looks like it's only near this inside elbow. It's where I'm losing the most. I'm losing a little bit here, but near the inside elbow is where I'm losing the most energy, the most pressure. Okay, and down here, it's just, again, astronaut. It's, that's part of the reason why I'm losing so much pressure in this elbow. So, again, you can use those conventional approaches to look at pressure drops, um, which is just kind of looking at uh, pressure here, pressure there, and comparing them. Uh, but the pressure gradients really allow you to hone in a little more three-dimensionally and, and focus in on what, what's causing some of those pressure drops. Okay. Um, all right, so... Maybe before I forget, I'll, I'll put, at least post it in the chat. Just uh, about maybe shooting me an email or something if uh, if you can't copy it out of the chat. Does it work here? I, I pasted the equation into the chat, so you might have it for the short term. If you still don't, if, it, if that doesn't work for you, then let me know. I'll or shoot me a quick email. I'll send it to you through there. Um, all right. So next, do you want to say now? So anyway, we looked at uh, multiple multi isos, which is uh, allows you to create multiple iso plots very quickly, rather than having to do them one at a time. So that's one I re I I really like this. I wish you know I, I, for years I've been wishing they'd they'd do something like this. Um, and then the the gradients as well. That's another. I think it's a very nice uh, enhancement. But um, next next we'll move into uh, our free surface, our final one, final example for today. How are we doing on time? Oh, it looks like pretty good. So for the free surface modeling, this one's a pretty big enhancement. This, this really expands our, our capability by quite a bit. I want to show you a couple animations here. Let me, let me play these two animations on the left first to show you what we're talking about with uh, free surface modeling. So what you're seeing here is... Um, We've modeled the free surface of the water. There's a split between the water and the air, which we in previous versions we we aren't able, we weren't able to model. You, if you want if you wanted to do multi-phase, if you wanted to have a liquid and a gas, they'd have to exist in two completely separate domains. Okay, so you'd, you could do, we could do things like heat exchangers, where you'd have um, you'd have a coolant inside some tubes or pipes, basically the heat exchanger. And then, uh, or a radiator, for example, and then you could have air flowing over top of it. But keep in mind that those two domains are separated by each other, separated from each other through uh, solid media, through the solid body of the radiator. Now, now in 2018, we can have two immiscible, unmixable uh, fluids inside the same domain, and they can they'll interact through a common surface. So that way, you're able to do you're we're able to solve things like like uh, drag over a canoe body or boats, boat hulls, that kind of thing. Okay. Here in this animation, you're seeing kind of the uh, pressures acting on the bottom surface of the canoe as it's, as, as it's speeding up. Okay. We're dragging this thing along at some high, high speed or like if it was like a motor boat or something. Okay. And then another things we can do now with this functionality, we can do like fill, filling analysis. So here I have a, uh, anybody recognize this? It's a um, hot water heater, basically. Um, without the coils and all that mod modeled in. Um, not to scale exactly, but here I've got uh, water getting pumped in. And here's what that filling animation looks like. Maybe I'll replay the beginning of it as well. Showing pressure lines as well. So your water heater, as you, as you might realize, doesn't fill all the way to the brim, right? You have a little air packet in the top there based on how far this hot water line comes down. So you see that complex uh, filling in the beginning too. Okay. Again, not sure how well that that plays through the uh, the go to webinar, but hopefully you see it well enough. So what I can do is just show you a, a quick example. Maybe I'll, I'll go through the what, what we have time for. Maybe the at least the canoe, and if we have some extra time, maybe maybe a little bit of the water heater, just to show you what what does it take to set something like this up. And it's actually pretty simple. Okay.
Mm. All right, so this is the canoe model. You can actually download, I think it's on GrabCAD. You can go download it from GrabCAD. I just pulled it from there just to play around with it. Now, uh, if you want to set up a free surface, uh, basically water at some level, okay, you, have to, you have to decide uh, where the canoe is going to be sitting with respect to the water. Okay, it's not, The flow summation isn't going to solve for that. Um, there's a question here. Would this would this allow for a simulation of typical kitchen blender blending two liquids? Um, mm, I th we can we can kind yeah it, would, it might help with that. We can kind of do that without the free surface, but the free surface will help because you'll you'll be able to see the top surface. Now, if there's a lot of splashing, as as is common with the blender, if there's a lot of splashing around, that's not going to get modeled very well, unfortunately. So, it's it, it, the answer to that is kind of yes, but there's a lot of limitations that, that you'll, you'll probably going to have to work around or bump into. Okay, So I'll, I'll kind of show you a list of the limitations a little bit later on as well that might help answer that question. Okay, But short answer, kind of yes, but not, not really. It's going to be too many, I think, too many limitations on that for a blender. Um, all right, so uh, with this canoe, uh, in order to set up a free surface simulation. The canoe, it treats the canoe as a rigid body that doesn't move around. So if there's water bumping into it, it's not going to cause the canoe to move up, move down, etc. So I have to, I can look at the forces acting on the canoe and then draw my own conclusions about where the canoe is going to be resting on the water and how it's going to bend and twist and, and turn. Okay, but it, you're not going to, currently in the current release of flow simulation, you're not going to see the canoe getting bounced around by the, by the water. Now part of the setup, when you're, when you're creating these free surface uh, now this is, by the way, this free service, if you have Flow Simulation 2018, it's not no special version of it. If you have Flow Simulation 2018, you'll, you'll have this capability. Um, but to get into that setup, ooh, of course I picked a fine mesh, didn't I? Might open up uh, another session to speed it up, maybe look at the course one. It's based on time. Mm -mm. Right, because I'm running out of RAM with all these big models I've been opening up. Let's do that. Ooh, all right. I guess I'll come up right when I'm about to interrupt. All right. So in order to set up the uh, free surface modeling, um, typically when you're, when you're creating a new study, you just go into the wizard. Okay. And then part of those steps in the wizard, you'll see this step here where you'll just turn on free, uh, free surface. Okay. You notice when I turn on free surface, we can't do rotation with it. That's another limitation. We can't do, uh, you can't have a rotating impeller moving around the free surface. That's currently uh, limit, limited. Um, also, you'll likely want to turn on gravity for a lot of these free surface applications. So for filling applications or especially for this one. And then later on in the steps, you'll add both air and water typically for most free surface examples. But you can do any, any liquid, any gas to my knowledge. Okay. And when you're adding these fluids, you don't have to browse them every time, by the way. Here's a little shortcut for you. If you just, when you're adding liquids, if you just click the add button, it'll add water first. And if you click the add button again, it automatically grabs air next. Okay, so you don't have to browse any. Just add twice, boom, boom, air, water. That's always what it defaults to. Then uh, when you're creating the free surface, you have to go under this concentrations. When you get to the initial ambient condition step, go into this concentrations. And then make sure you select dependency. You click on this field, you click dependency, and then here's where you tell it where that dividing line is between the water, which it puts in blue or in white in this case, and the air. You'll tell it exactly what height is that dividing line going to be located. So you can kind of see the way I've entered that in. Now, so basically that height is, as you saw in that animation, somewhere it's like right about here in this ballpark. Okay, without getting too uh, picky about the detail there. Now, because that height is somewhere right about here. That would also that would also fill my canoe with water. Okay, so here you can actually see I modeled in this dividing line here. Okay, that would end up filling my canoe with some water because of where I'm starting all that water. So I need to set up an initial condition here, where uh, I tell it this region, this body. I had to create a separate body. I use the uh, the uh, like the cavity feature in SOLIDWORKS, or you can use the combine tool or the um, 
intersect tool is a really handy one for this type of thing. But I created a body here. You can see it's highlighted. And I told it this body should also be air. Just told it air for the substance concentration. Okay. Then uh, I specified um, also some velocity that that, so just like you do with uh, any typical drag problem, you'd, you'd specify some sort of uh, incoming velocity as part of those initial conditions. And I have that velocity sort of scaling up. I can show you that equation if you're interested in that. Basically, it's just a stepping, it's just stepping up the velocity from like 5 miles per hour to 10 miles per hour to now I'm dragging it at 20 miles per hour just to see the, the different drag acting on it. Now another question, uh, can you do icing? Like icing for, like icing on a cake kind of a thing? Uh, no, I don't think that would work too well. Well, what do you, oh, what kind of ice, no, no, not icing on a cake. What, what kind, what kind of icing? Oh, okay. okay if, if water's just freezing. Okay, phase change. Uh, no, we don't do phase change either. Not, not yet. Nope. So that's also not supported yet. Okay. Um, all right. So if I uh, show uh, running these studies d does take some time, and, an and another consideration when you whenever you're doing this free surface modeling, um, we're gonna have to start wrapping up at this point. Uh, another consideration is when you're doing this free surface modeling, you have to make the mesh very fine in the region where your free surface is located. You see, I've added a little local mesh tool to make the mesh nice and fine in those regions. That way, it can capture the uh, the deltas in that uh, really need to capture that dividing line between the free surfaces very accurately to, to get accurate results. Okay, so, so go ahead and try it out. Uh, set up a free surface study. Let me know how it goes. I can, if anybody's interested, I can send some of these models as well and you can kind of play with them. Um, and uh, uh, just be advised though the runtime is a little bit lengthy. Okay, this one with the fine mesh um, 4,100 seconds, uh, what is that, like a little over 10 hours. Okay, with the coarser mesh, it gave me decent results, and it was a lot faster, but, so you might run it overnight and see the kind of results you get out of it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, very good, just, uh, yeah, Donna, please send me a, an email after the session, that way I'll be able to follow up with you. Anybody else who's interested, I can forge you over the models. Um, all right, so what else? I think to, to wrap things up with the free surface, I was going to talk about the limitations briefly. So what some of the things you can simulate with the free surface modeling, filling, okay, filling of containers, sloshing to some extent, uh, like I was doing with that uh, uh, example with the boat, floating, buoyancy, drag, calculating drag. Dams and spillways, Just, we, I can show you a bunch of animations for that currently, and then uh, a bunch of other applications, but things that we're uh, limited on. Uh, you can't really do droplets or atomization. Those would require substantially fine meshes. It's not very practical. Sprayer nozzles, that kind of stuff. The free surface doesn't calculate surface tension, so that might that might create a little bit of a limitation, even, even with some of these examples of, uh, of drag, because the surface tension may add to the drag a little bit. And then also... Uh, if you have turbulent surfaces, if that free surface becomes turbulent and there's a lot of splashing around, that that's not that's currently uh, it, the, the mesh size it, that's kind of falls in line with the droplets a little bit and the atomization a little bit, but um, we're more of the droplets. Just requires such a such a fine mesh to try to capture those types of details. It's not very practical using our free surface technique to uh, to date. Okay, and that's uh, s same with uh, uh, a lot of other free surface modeling tools out there as well. They they have a lot of these same kind of limitations. All right, so I, I, that about that covers all the core new features. If you're interested in learning about some of the other little new enhancements, uh, feel free to check out the What's New document. Um, that's just in your help pull down in SOLIDWORKS. Uh, a lot of the enhancements that I didn't spend any time with there, you pretty much just read what it says, and it it should pretty much clear. I don't I don't think many of the enhancements may not require much of a demonstration. So you just go to the help pull down under the PDF. If I look under uh, for those of you interested in plastics. Okay, some of these might require some explanation if you're interested. Simulation talks about the topology, which I demonstrated, and a few other things there. And then uh, uh, flow simulation also listed in here as well. And you can kind of read through, hey, they, you, you can have a horizontal color bar. Um, so if, if you wanted to toggle that. Okay. So feel free to read through some of those if you're interested in f a few of the other little capabilities along the way. 
All right. Uh, I guess we'll wrap up here. If if there's any further questions, I'll stick around for a bit here and, and help with that. And then, uh, again, feel free to send me your email, which uh, let me put my email on the slide here. Mm -mm -mm. And I'm just waiting for any other questions, if it, for those of you willing to stick around for a bit. But feel free to send me an email if you do have any other questions and you need to leave or something, then that's fine. And uh, for those of you leaving, thanks. thank you very much for coming. We'll talk to you later. Hopefully it was helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Yep. Take care, Steve. Steven. You're good. All right, looks like maybe no further questions. I'll hold for a little bit longer just in case, but go ahead and uh, cut it off here in a moment. All right, we'll go ahead and cut it off now. Thank you.